meeting of Senate Budget Subcommittee Number One on Education Finance. Uh, welcome to our first hearing of the year, our first um, hearing on the governor's budget. Um, we have a very interesting meeting today, two parts. The first part will deal particularly with the K-14 budget, the Prop 98 part of our budget. Um, the second part of our agenda, Part B, deals with the UC and the CSU. Um, we have some very um, knowledgeable witnesses who will be testifying before us today. We have my committee, the committee is here now in its entirety. Um, my vice chair is Senator Morlock, um, the other committee members, Senator Allen and myself. Um, and we will move right to the agenda. There will be no votes. No votes are anticipated today. The items will be heard. Um, and they'll be heard today, frankly, as our first meeting, more as an overview of items. We'll be digging deeper into the details of most of these items at subsequent meetings. Um, before we begin, I'd like to ask uh, my vice chair and committee member, Alan, as well, if they have any initial comments. Mr. Chair, I'm excited that we're discussing Prop 98, so I'll have lots of questions on that subject. Thank you very much. Okay, so if you have early plane reservations, change them. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Allen? I'm excited, too. <laughs> Okay, we have a very excited committee today, and we're most excited about our first witness, who is the superintendent for the state of California, Tom Trollickson. Ms. Trollickson, please come up. Welcome, Good Tom. Morning. Good morning. Great to be with an excited committee <laughs> <laughs> and fervent about education improving proving the potential of all of our students to enjoy their greatest capacity and fulfill their dreams. So uh, again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to be here to testify. Uh, Vice Chairman Morlock, uh, good to be here. Senator Allen, great to be with you, uh, giving me a chance to speak about the governor's proposed 2016-17 budget. And as you well know, we are in the midst of exciting times in public education. New standards, new assessments, new accountability systems, lots of work, lots of creative thinking, much of which I believe we are defining as the California way, which is a, a pace and a pattern that we've set that a lot of the rest of the country is following that, and a lot of it got embedded in uh, the new ESSA, the new federal law that uh, we got away with, we did away with no child left behind. We finally left that behind and it, we have a new paradigm. And so we're looking forward to sharing a little bit more about that. This budget is good news for California students, teachers, classified staff, administrators, and school board members. The ongoing economic recovery will increase Proposition 98 budget guarantee for schools up to $71.6 billion. That's a huge improvement from the $47.3 billion budget share in the depths of the recession five years ago. It's up a couple of billion dollars, and we'll know more with May Revise, and Department of Finance may have even more updated numbers, but we're a couple of billion over where we were uh, in last year's bu budget. And right now, I call it a renaissance. There is a renaissance in publication going on in California, taking place, art, music, drama, dance coming back, CTE, a huge investment. Thank you to this committee, thanks to the legislature, thanks to the governor's vision and, and support. Uh, investment in science and getting new science curriculum out, new science uh, professional development out there. Uh, we see smaller class sizes as part of this renaissance and part of this new flexibility that's coming with the budget. And of course, local control funding formula, we'll probably talk in the question and answer about that and the LCAPs, but it is targeting money in the right way to help students in poverty, help English learners, and help our foster kids. But as things get better, I don't want anyone to forget how much our schools suffered during the recession. School districts dramatically increased class size, laid off over 50,000 teachers and classified, talented staff, slashed arts, music, drama, dance, and so many other things, civics and science, uh, CTE, were cut short. Uh, many skilled and devoted, talented teachers left this profession, this great profession, Enrollment in teacher training programs plummeted. Supply of newly prepared teachers is at a 12-year low, 
with enrollment in California teacher preparation programs down 76% from 2001 to 2014. To bring California teacher student ratios back to just where they were before the recession, schools would have to hire another 60,000 new teachers beyond current hiring needs. Last year, California credentialed 15,000 new teachers. But the demand in the marketplace, the demand of our schools was 22,000. I talked to principal after principal as I traveled the state, superintendent after superintendent. Uh, they were having difficulty in special areas like special needs, math and science, career tech, even in the arts. But they were also having trouble just filling uh, positions in English and, and social studies and social science. So addressing this enormous challenge of shortage in education is one of my very top priorities. And I know the legislature is focusing on this. Senator Allen has a bill uh, that will address some of the key uh, challenges that, that this shortage confronts us with. So one of the ways we can help with the shortage and make the profession more attractive is to invest in it. Uh, I think it's key that we uh, address the challenge by making sure that our administrators and teachers have the equipment and the supplies they need, uh, the computers and the training to use the computers. Uh, I had an issue five years ago, we called it No Child Left Offline. Uh, we have seen a huge investment, the state stepped up nearly a billion dollars, a couple of budgets back to provide internet connecting devices, bandwidth, speed, capacity. Uh, this has been helpful and the training for our educators on how to use the digital world of learning in the most effective way for our kids learning. Uh, we still have though, however, a huge digital divide and this is part of uh, the big achievement gap and the big opportunity gap that we talk about and focus on greatly. It's also to help with our teacher supply and the teacher shortage and making the profession more attractive, to provide more professional development to meet the new standards and to use the new equipment. I thank the legislature again uh, for the 1.25 billion that was invested in professional development a few years ago. Uh, and now more recently in your budget last year, $490 million to increase capacity for the teacher workforce to be able to uh, more readily and effectively deliver uh, the learning to the new standards. It's also important to provide exciting programs that engage students and parents. STEM learning, fun science labs and field trips, special help for English learners, and CTE in a huge way it's making a difference. The investment that the legislature has made and the governor, thank you again, 500 million in the Career Pathways Trust, another 400 million this year in the new incentive grants. It's learning connected to jobs students dream of holding. It's learning with a purpose. It's hands-on and minds-on at the same time. Just look at the popularity of these programs. And I'll give you one example. Up in Del Norte County, visited nine North State counties recently. Uh, they have a high school uh, program with 3D printers. They have uh, a construction academy, uh, engineering construction academy, where the students buy a, a lot of land uh, at the beginning of each year. They, using CAD computer-aided drafting equipment, they draft they draw, they design a house, and then they go out and they build it. And they, in the morning, they take their science classes and math classes and social science classes. In the afternoon, they go out to the construction site. They build the house, laying in all the digital and electrical and sewer and water lines and, and, and get inside. And you can see them looking how they will design the kitchen and how they design different features of the building. And they do it. And then they're proud. It's hands-on, skills for life. And then they sell the house and the next year students have a pot of money to go back and do the same thing again. Isn't that great? It's just one example, and these are very popular programs. Uh, we see success all around the states. We know what our graduation rate overall is. It's at an all-time high, 81%. But in career technical education courses, it's about 90 to 95%. In many that I visited, it's 100% graduation and 100% college going. So again, this is uh, the kind of programs that I think are going to attract more teachers to come into the profession and come from the private sector and join the profession to help us with that teacher shortage. I want to again thank you for believing in the transformative powers of CTE and investing. It's great for students, it's great for, the econ for our economy, and it's great for parents who want to see their students graduate and get jobs, good jobs. So do we, how do we scale up? from programs that we know work and close the achievement gap and the opportunity gap. 
California is on the way back, headed in the right direction, but is it enough? Is it adequate? Is it where California should be? Is it where our students uh, should have in terms of the support needed? And I say no, we must invest more. And the public wants us to invest more. Compare for a moment, however, just consider some other states per pupil investment compared to ours. According to Education Week 2013, California had an $8,200 per pupil investment to our students. New York and New Jersey were double that. They were at 20, 21,000. Vermont and Wyoming were double what California was investing. Wyoming was investing $15,700 per pupil while we were investing $8,200 per pupil. Being 42nd in the nation per pupil investment is not where California should be. Californians clearly care about their schools, are willing to invest in education. Our residents, our voters have consistently supported investing with local measures and with state bonds, but they also, of course, expect the state to do its share. So where are we as a state compared with before the recession? I have a chart that I've handed out for you just to take a look at. It's got a red and a blue line. For K-12 spending, you can see that we have gone back. This budget brings us to $10,600 per pupil, still ranking us in the lower ranks of the nation, but that's better than where we were a couple of years ago. And if you see this chart, uh, we're recovered back to the, the 2007 level. Uh, we're just about equal, a little bit better than the 2007 level. The other charts I wanted to show you, however, Total enrollment for early education is the yellow line. Uh, of course, we're, we know more and more research is confirming the, the need to invest early, the, the huge dividends, the brain growth that occurs during this time, the 30 million word gap that occurs if you don't have the stimulation, uh, you don't have the, the right environment. So preschool is, early education is critically important. You can see from the yellow line that we're down 76,000 slots in California from where we were before. So we've not recovered in early learning from uh, where the recession was. We're down 22% from that point. There's another infant toddler. You see it's an even bigger drop in the infant toddler with the blue graph line. I would rather be discussing instead of that, that catch up, but I'd hoped we'd already been able to reach that. Uh, but I would rather be discussing how to invest in full day kindergarten, mandatory kindergarten, expanding TK and preschool to all four year olds. I think many of us would like that opportunity to see how we could invest in those areas. This does lead me to discuss the governor's proposed early learning block grant program. The governor proposed to redirect 1.7 billion in Prop 98 funds to create a new block grant for low income and at risk preschoolers. This proposed block grant redirects all Prop 98 funds from state preschool, transitional kindergarten, and the state preschool quality rating and improvement system into one block grant. This proposal raises big questions and very serious concerns from a number of quarters. I await more details before taking a definitive position, but I must point out that the plan, as it appears at this point, keeps spending flat, even though we know that we have a great demand expanding, we have a rising demand, that we are far from funding all the children who would like to take a TK, all the four-year-olds uh, whose parents would want them to have an earlier start in our public schools. So we're already falling behind the number of care slots for infants, I think I pointed out in the graph, I won't repeat that to you, uh, but we're falling behind in terms of the, the current demand and the waiting list. I've talked to uh, teachers who are teaching TK and they're uh, in one, uh, one district, uh, small, medium, you know, small size district, 100 um, parents waiting to have their kids come into the program. The other thing we should note is that we need to provide high quality instruction and maximize access for our youngest learners, especially the at risk and low income communities. CDE, my department, is focused on guaranteeing quality through the quality rating and improvement system, and we should have a focus on that. And, and the question is, can we have a dispersed system across 1,100 LEAs that would maintain the, the quality? Uh, we also must maintain appropriate adult to child ratios in our schools. These issues are so important and complex that I urge the legislature to carefully review the proposal in the appropriate policy committees uh, rather than necessarily try to tackle it in a short time frame in the budget process. The last three issues, English learners, 
critically important for the future of this state, the future of our economy, the future of our families. Supporting those English learners, it's part of our LCAP goals, it's part of the, uh, the targets that we have set through the local control funding formula. Uh, we have created a division within my department to bring together all the English learner programs under one, one leadership, one, one team. Uh, we are in the budget draft proposal for three positions to help us uh, enforce the uh, guidelines for supports to English learners. Uh, so that is something that uh, I think you'll see in the budget process. So we urge your support of that. Uh, we have additionally, of course, uh, we're collecting best practices of how to help English learners uh, reclass as quickly as possible, become as proficient as possible, as soon as possible in English while maintaining their native language, whether it's uh, Vietnamese or Spanish or Chinese. And we uh, have a seal of biliteracy. We went from about 10,000 students graduating with competency in more, two or more languages, and now we're at 35,000. Uh, so we're pleased with that progress. The last two issues. All of that I've said is why I'm strongly supporting an initiative to continue the level of funding that Prop 30's brought us. The rebounding economy, uh, has been miraculous and helpful. Can we count on it in the long haul? There are ups and downs in the economy. Uh, I believe it is essential to not let the current $8 billion a year slip away. We need those funds to continue to scale up the programs that I've mentioned, discussed with you here today. I also strongly support the $9 billion school facilities bond. I was serving in the legislature as an assembly member, uh, part of a team that put together the package, Senate Bill 50, which became the framework for the current bond program, went to the voters four times, had incredible strong support. The voters said yes to a, an investment of $45 billion, but we haven't had a bond measure since 2006 and the coffers ran dry. Local communities, local school boards got together and passed local bond measures. There's probably 20 to $25 billion of voter approved measures awaiting match from the state. And we have not been able to provide that match over the last few years. So I think it's time again, to ask California voters to invest, support that $9 billion measure. It's qualified for the November ballot. As you may know, it includes $3 billion for new construction, $3 billion for modernization, five in the K-12 schools, $500 million for charter schools, $500 million for career tech, and $2 billion for community colleges. These are important opportunities I urge you to consider. Uh, there's much work to do, as you well know, and I believe we're up to the challenge. We're on the right track moving in the right direction, and I thank you. Be glad to answer your questions. Thank you, Superintendent. I'll have a few questions, and I'm sure my colleagues will yes. as well. Um, first question deals with the Prop 30 extension, and when we, we first went for the additional tax dollars, it was relatively, relatively easy um, to convince my constituents after years of cuts and, and an era when um, we had not funded um, K-12 education uh, nearly as well as we should have, that we needed the additional dollars. Um, times have gotten better. Uh, for the last three years, we've, we've inserted about $13 billion more dollars into yep. the K-12 budget. So the question I repeatedly get from constituents when we talk about an extension is, have I gotten my money's worth for the $13 billion? Um, and I asked a question to uh, Michael Kirst when we spoke with him. Um, would be interested, it's probably something I'll be asking several people over the course of the next couple of months. Um, number one, did we get, did the taxpayers get their money's worth for the $13 billion? And number two, how do we even measure that? How do we know that? Well, I will definitively say absolutely yes, they did. I, I truly believe that. Uh, and I mentioned some of the, you know, progressive, exciting programs that parents are supporting because they give kids the skills to compete in the 21st century economy, to get great jobs, great careers, get to college, succeed in college. Uh, so yes, we could enumerate, we'll give you some follow up in terms of a breakdown of the billions and where some of them have been invested, but we know uh, getting to world-class standards so we can be competitive, raising the bar for the 
the, the learning level that we want our students to be proficient at, uh, that's cost some money. And we've invested, again, about a billion and a half uh, dollars into those programs. We've invested in uh, computers and in, in getting our kids into the 21st century with the use and the adept use of technology, which they're so good at, but we need, you know, we're far short of where we should be in having one-to-one -one computing capacity. And we're far short of what we should have in terms of home connections. There's a lot of creative things going on in the state where mayors of cities uh, are working with their schools and looking at how to expand hotspots and ways that we can get our kids connected uh, to the internet. Uh, so I would say we, we should put a spotlight, and we did that during the crisis, during the recession. I declared a state of fiscal emergency for California. We're not in that emergency today, but we're in an urgency. We're 42nd in the nation per pupil spending. Other states are investing in science and in, and in career tech and in other programs. Uh, we're competing with those other states as well as we're competing uh, around the world with other countries. Uh, for the jobs that are going to be the jobs of now and the jobs that haven't even been invented yet that will be the jobs of the future. So, um, you know, b those are key areas where we've invested in, in building capacity. Part of what the beauty is of the new federal law is it mirrors what we've done in California. We must invest in teacher training and capacity building, and that's been a part of the expenditure. And districts like Inglewood that the state asked me to take over because of its fiscal problems, they haven't had a salary raise for about seven years. And so you think about that in terms of attracting people to the profession, maintaining staff, avoiding staff turnover and churn, uh, which can disrupt uh, learning. So districts are investing in, in, in bringing up some of the salary levels and targeting money for English learners, targeting money for kids in poverty. So I would say yes, and we have some homework to do, uh, no pun intended with our education metaphor here, but we have homework to do to share with the voters the exciting and relevant things going on. And, and I, I, don't, I have not heard complaints about the current level of taxation. The ballot measure does take away the quarter cent sales tax. Um, I, I believe that it's a, a good balance and that it is absolutely essential that we invest further. A follow-up, you've mentioned a couple times our status is 42nd in the nation. Now, the LAO last year, and I'll be asking them that question when they come up this today, <clears throat> last year they said that that's not any, any longer a true statistic, that um, that measures where we were probably two or three years ago, that there's a lag in terms of when you can compare the, the different states when things are reported, that frankly now that we're over 10,000, 42nd in the nation is a bad statistic, that we're probably somewhere they told me last year near the middle of the pack. Is that correct or are they wrong? There's different ways to calculate, and I'll ask Deborah Brown, who is my new uh, government affairs, congratulations to her, to her coming on board, and you'll see more of her. Uh, I'll see if she hasn't answered that, but we do, we can get you the this, this, this citation of where we uh, got, got that number from. Well, in the statistics I uh, shared with you earlier about New York and New Jersey being double at 20,000 approximately per pupil, and we were 86. Yes, now we are at, at $10,600 per pupil, but the other states in those last few years have also been raising the bar and, and raising their, their level of investment. So um, if it's, for, we were 49th in the nation, now we're 42nd or maybe we're 39th. Uh, wherever we are, California used to be at the top. We were ranked in the top five in the nation in what we invested, and guess what? No surprise, our test scores in math and science and in English language arts were in the top five, right along with the others that are, in, are big investors in education. Yeah, and, and I would agree. If we're 25th or 30th, that's not necessarily good enough for California, but I think we do need to be as, as accurate as possible yeah. in talking to the voters. Good Definitely. point. Yeah, I was just going to add that, that the challenge is also with the, with the delay in, in the information and also which, which information you use if it's adjusted for cost of living, which obviously in California is going to be much uh, much higher. And so that that is a different level. So um, you have different folks reporting different things based on cost of living adjustments. But I, I would also say the, the point is really about where do we want to be um, with our schools and is the average good enough for us or do we really want to see um, uh, increases in support for our, for our students and in particular see increases in, in the number of adults that are there to help our kids, the number of counselors and, and teacher librarians and nurses. Um, that's where the investment comes in. Great. Thank you. One, one more question, then I'll go to my colleagues. Um, in terms of teacher shortage, which I think is mm -hmm. a, a horrible problem confronting us, uh, Fran Pavley had a bill to revitalize the Apple program. Yes. 
um, which got held last year. Uh, where is the department on revitalizing the Apple program on Ms. Pavley's, Senator Pavley's bill in particular, um, or other ideas like that? Well, th thank you, and uh, we're Foursquare at her side. In fact, I'm sponsoring the bill. My department and I are sponsoring the bill. We think it makes sense. Uh, we, we need some incentives, uh, particularly, again, in some of the more challenging parts of California where uh, it's hard to recruit teachers sometimes to some of the inner urban city areas and some of the rural areas of California. So um, Foursquare is strong. Uh, Senator Allen has a program dealing, looking at residency and, and, and greater grounding before you get in the classroom. and and uh, you know, a chance to really see how you uh, fit with the profession and, and how you, you will do. Uh, there's a number of other bills that are gonna be uh, brought forward. Uh, one of the areas we're looking at too is, uh, we see these teacher cadet programs uh, in, in uh, San Bernardino Unified School District, Liberty District up in uh, Northern California, in, in Brentwood, Northern California. They have programs, it's a three-year program on how to become a teacher, and, and they, they talk all about pedagogy, the kids' uh, development, and how, you, how you learn to be a teacher and you get coursework for three years in high school and you have experience, you know, working with kids, reading to them, uh, doing lessons with junior high kids and with elementary grade kids. And those, those students go on and they get preference at the local San Bernardino State University, for instance, and they go into the teacher program. They're through it faster and guess what, when they get their credential, they come back and they represent the diversity of the communities they've come from. So we're having a you know difficult time filling uh, spots to represent African American, Latino teachers and administrators. This is one way to deal with it. And another program that's being looked at that I think is promising is to start the teacher training in in college in your junior and senior years, so that you can graduate with a BS or BA degree and a teaching credential and go right into the workforce. So there are programs in other states that we're looking at that I think that would save time. It would save a debt load on new teachers in terms of having to have a uh, loan and two more, you know, maybe another year, year and a half before they can actually go and teach. I think most of my colleagues agree that uh, Senator Pavley's bill and the Apple program is, is, would be an important step. The sticker has been the money coming out of general fund as opposed to Prop 98. Would the department support um, the legislature moving in the direction of using Prop 98 funding if we can get that legally approved for funding the Apple program? Yes, I would look at that. That's, that's a logical uh, pathway to finding the revenues it's supporting. I, I, I do think that it is a statewide responsibility to credential our teachers, to train, to, to guide them through induction, and to help them financially. It is a, truly a state of California obligation, uh, but to the degree that 98 can help in that and, you know, there may be some one-time money that could be invested and stretched over a number of years during the time when we're facing uh, this urgent need. I, mean, I think the problem that Senator Pally's running into, and I'm incredibly supportive of the bill, and we were here in this very mm -hmm. room announcing it uh, with the other bills. Um, I think the problem that she runs into is that the money for Apple goes to the universities, and 98 requires the money mm -hmm. to go through LEAs. And that's, that's the kind of essential rub. Uh, and, and so it may take, you know, I, I, mm -hmm. there's no question, I think everyone here understands it, how important this is. And, 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 and really this affordability issue is, is a barrier, particularly given how little we pay starting teachers. But we've got to figure out together a way around this. And if there's a way that we could, you know, find another funding source in the general fund or through Prop 98. But I think right now, my understanding is, is that, that, that Apple cannot be funded through 98 because 98 money has to go to the LEAs. Well, we'll look at that. And I have written a letter to all the deans of education for the schools of education in California to, to put our collective thoughts together. And you've certainly put out a good idea, a, a good challenge to figure out a way. Okay, now we'll move to uh, my vice chair, Senator Morlock. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Superintendent Turlickson. Good morning. Um, I think you mentioned that during the recession, some 50,000 mm -hmm. teachers were laid off. Uh, teachers and classified. And so 50,000 roughly. So roughly, I think it was 30 to 35,000 teachers and uh, the okay. rest, the balance is classified. And then did, did you do any surveys to see where they went? I didn't, our, our department didn't, but we've looked at other research. Uh, it's, it's not robust, but uh, we know that a number went on in, in their lives, uh, particularly younger teachers went on to 
pursue other careers uh, as attractive as teaching was to them. Uh, the uncertainty and, and you know, being hired and then laid off uh, was, was part of it. Um, and others went back to, to uh, retire uh, instead of coming back into the profession. So, so some of those were early retirements? Yes. So you got the nearly deads and the newlyweds. <laughs> and everyone else in between has been there a long time, yeah. so they, they're protected. <laughs> but all the new teachers were not. You had to use the LIFO method, the last in, mm -hmm. first out. Mm -hmm. I think it's being litigated uh, yeah. for for Garo. Is that the Bergara. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, but but how do you how do you encourage people to go into a career of teaching if if you, when you have a, an economic downturn, they're the first ones that are asked to mm -hmm. leave. Your paradigm is longevity, not excellence. Right. So how do we fix that? 